this opportunity of moderating this so high level panel that will be addressing today perhaps two of the main issues that uh, have to do with the social hurt of the international trade system. The main concern of this discussion will be focused on the sustainability aspects of the trade agreements and mainly focus on the labor and environmental provisions of the trade agreements. Before passing the torch to these so high level uh, speakers, let me share with you very briefly some of the findings of a public opinion survey that we have been conducting at the Inter-American Development Bank over these last three years that is mainly focused on the issues of trade, integration, and sustainability and labor rights of the workers. This public opinion survey uh, has more than 60,000 face-to-face interviews across 18 different countries and it's showing us a very brief picture from the ground, from the Latin American ground with respect to the two issues, the two topics that we'll be addressing this afternoon. We asked to the Latin Americans what do they think about the possibility of introducing uh, uh, levels of protections of the workers into the uh, trade agreements. The level of approval of this sort of measures are almost 50% of the opinions. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, five out of every 10 Latin Americans are in favor, are, in, are also expressing their willingness of pay up to 20% more for each product that is contemplating the protection of the workers. The same situation is with the environmental um, disposition of the trade agreements. Also, almost or more than eight out of every 10 Latin Americans are in favor of the free mobility of the workers <coughs> within the region. And the same proportion, the same number of the Latin Americans are in favor of globalization as a driver of economic growth. So the Latin Americans are giving a strong support to the globalization process, but it's not a blank note. It's contemplating the social provisions of the workers, the uh, rights of the workers, and also the environmental aspects of the trade agreements. So, uh, we have more um, findings about this public opinion survey. This on, on the website. But the last one that I would like to share with the speakers has to do with the uh, option between economic growth and uh, fight against climate change. We when, we, uh, when we asked to the Latin Americans what do they think about the possibility of choosing between economic growth and climate uh, protection or fighting ag against climate change, the vast majority of the Latin American choose the possibility of supporting the fight against climate change. So there is a very high level of conscience of in our region supporting the, the topics that we'll be addressing uh, this afternoon. So the rule of the game will be as follows. We, we, uh, each speaker will have um, about one hour and a half. <laughs> I am joking, about uh, six minutes for the first round of the presentation. The first round of, of the presentation will be aiming to provide a general framework <coughs> about these topics. And then we will have a second round after the, the questions from the public that will be tried to address the, um, policy, uh, the public policies options on this regard <coughs> and also taking into account the possibility of translating <coughs> these uh, provisions into the multilateral trading systems. So we will start with Peter Draper. Peter, uh, we have suggested you the following angle. Overview of how environmental and social concerns have been addressed in modern RTAs and how much provisions, institutional mechanisms and enforcement procedures have evolved, evolved over time. Peter 
has an extensive career in South Africa and also in the World Economic Forum. I will summarize some of uh, his main achievements. He is managing director of Tutua Consulting Group. In South Africa, he is also senior research fellow in the Economic Diplomacy Program at the South African Institute of International Affairs. He is a member of a board of trustees of the Botswana Institute for Development Policy Analysis. He is member and co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the Global Trade and F FDI System. Member of the board of trustees of the International Chambers of Commerce Research Foundation. Non-resident fellow, senior fellow of the Brussels-based European Center for International Political Economy and also uh, previously, he, previously he worked in South Africa's National Department of Trade and Industry in bilateral economic relations. Focus on East Asia and Mercosur. Peter, you have the floor. You will have six, <coughs> six and seven minutes. Thanks very much, Gustavo. So I think my job is to frame uh, the conversation and I think a lot of the details will come through in the other individual presentations. So this, what I'm going to present is based on a paper that we did for the ICTSD. Uh, it was published in, in June, if I recall correctly. And uh, basically it was a textual analysis of uh, especially developed country trade agreements, um, what, what we refer to as uh, 21st century trade agreements and how they have approached and more importantly, codified the issue of sustainability. And sustainability, we uh, take to mean uh, a few things. So it's, it includes provisions on labor rights, um, provisions on transparency or governance uh, processes, so access to, to trade agreements and various processes associated with that, and also political participation. So that's sort of captured in the social provisions under sustainability provisions. Uh, and then we also looked at environmental issues, uh, which has, and there's a range of different provisions in the various agreements that we looked at. Uh, but the main ones clustered really around uh, the protection of the marine environment, protection of the ozone layer, and then also fisheries. Uh, and then in the EU-specific agreements, which also we, we covered, there are specific provisions on human rights protections, but these provisions are not really mirrored by other uh, developed country agreements that we looked at, because various developed countries have difficulties with, with this kind of, of language. Um, overall, what we found is that there's been a significant upsurge in the inclusion of sustainability uh, uh, development provisions in regional trade agreements, and particularly in deep integration trade agreements, but that the technology of incorporation uh, differs depending on the country or, or the main country uh, in question. So some RTAs contain more comprehensive provisions than others, and I'd refer you to the paper for the details where we break that down uh, in, in some detail, and I think a lot of those details will emerge throughout, through our discussion. Um, and what we've also seen over time is that the incorporation tools have undergone a substantive transformation away from mere dialogue provisions, so agreement to continue talking about sustainability, towards much more substantive provisions uh, uh, and in a, a range of different parts of these agreements. So now you find references to sustainability in the preambles to agreements, in the general exceptions clauses, in dedicated chapters, uh, through incorporation in other chapters, uh, through side letters and also through, through side agreements. So a range of different ways in which uh, sustainability development provisions are incorporated. Um, so overall the picture looks good in ter terms of integrating SDP provisions into trade agreements, but there is still no consensus to bind that through binding dispute settlement. It's really just the US that is an exception in that respect, uh, and there is the partial exception as well of what used to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I think it's now called the Comprehensive, uh, what is the second P in the CPTPP? 
Uh, comprehensive Trans and progressive, progressive. Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yes, sorry. So we haven't, we didn't update this to look at the CPTPP, but we did look at the TPP, which had relatively binding provisions on dispute settlement. So overall, uh, most states seem to prefer, at least in those agreements that we looked at, a soft law approach to incorporating sustainable development provisions rather than a hard law approach backed up by binding dispute settlement. Uh, and these soft law provisions take various forms. Uh, so cooperation mechanisms, so we agree to set up a joint committee, for instance. Consultation requirements, so every year or every five years, or whatever the time period is, a committee, committee will be established and we will consult each other on how these provisions are being actioned. Um, various enforcement mechanisms and, of course, reference to international agreements from ILO agreements to multilateral environmental agreements and so on. So, if, if, if you like, reaffirming international standards that countries have signed up to individually. Um, one partial exception to the relatively non-binding nature of most of these RTAs is that a lot of these agreements uh, incorporate investor state dispute settlement and that does offer a different route to binding dispute settlement and that of course is not without its own uh, controversies. Um, and then finally, and it's an obvious point to make but it's an important one, um, the standards in relation to particularly labour and the environment are actually quite similar across the various RTOs that we looked at, largely because they're incorporating reference to various multilateral agreements. Uh, so in other words, they're referring to similar international instruments. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. Now is the time for the workers. Peter Waldorf, his advisor LO, the Danish Trade Union Confederation. Uh, he has an impressive background in public services at the municipality level in Denmark and later on his responsibility in HK Denmark changed to serving the union members working for central government. In 1991, his position changed to head of secretariat. In 1998, he was elected president for his sector. From 2001 to 2007, he was leading the trade union negotiating team at the collective bargaining for central government. In the years 2000-2007, he was chairing the Standing Committee for National Administration in the European Federation of Public Service Unions. In 2007, he was elected General Secretary for, for the Global Union Federation, Public Services International based in France. In 2014, he started working for LO, the Danish Confederation of Trade Unions, in the Department of European and International Affairs. Again, Peter, the floor is yours. You will have another six minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Gustavo, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. I think it's really a timely uh, matter to discuss here in, uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, important parts of this uh, discussion about uh, the fairness in globalization is of course linked to the fact that we are talking about winners and uh, losers and I think that, not to any surprise, I'm sure you will see uh, that it's also very much about uh, labor rights, it's about living conditions for ordinary people, how do we create the best out of, uh, of, um, of the globalization and of, of, uh, of the trading relations. My confederation, uh, LO in Denmark, the, the, the trade union confederation, has over quite some time engaged in the debate uh, because we think that trade policy is extremely important in a time where uh, we need uh, and we have an increasing awareness uh, about the globalization and particularly about its significance when it comes to employment, when it comes to uh, working conditions, but also when it comes to uh, inequality, which has been proven by many also international institutions. 
Uh, and of course, it's not only about the labor issues, but this is also this is what I will talk mostly about. But it is also about the environmental and the, the climate uh, conditions, as I'm sure we will come back to also. <coughs> the good thing is that with the adoption of UN's uh, 17 development goals, uh, it has become a key objective to promote decent work, and it should also happen through the trade policies. Goal number eight on decent work and economic growth makes it clear that the creation of quality jobs will remain a major challenge for almost all economies in the future. So it's not just now a trade union demand, it is a commitment from all UN member states. So back to my own uh, trade union confederation, um, a considerable share of our efforts to find answers to these challenges coming from the gl growing globalization has to do with trade policy. And a substantial part of the current discussion on future trade policy is about the means to use and how to promote a trade policy that contributes to promoting sustainability and including these workers' rights. This summer, the European Commission launched a debate on which road the EU should take in the endeavors to use trade agreements for strengthening the workers' rights. One part of the question raised by the European Commission was whether the EU should continue the dialogue-based approach, what Peter just mentioned as the soft approach, or whether you should change into a more tough sanction-based approach like uh, the US. Before the EU launched this uh, discussion, we in fact had uh, commissioned uh, a, um, uh, a task to an associate professor at the University of uh, Copenhagen, his name is Jens Ladefod Mortensen, some of you might have met him, um, to prepare a discussion paper for LO to describe and uh, analyze the different methods chosen by the EU and the US. And the paper, I will not go into any details here, the time will not allow it, but the paper comes to the conclusion that you cannot in practice distinguish between precisely on the one hand the tough sanction-based approach used by, uh, by the US, or to describe as the way the US is working, and on the other hand the dialogue-based approach used to describe the EU. Because in reality, both the EU and the US use demands, threats and incentives to, uh, to, you could say, as political influencing instruments. Both the US and the EU will use the non-derogation clause as a kind of guarantee that you will not ease your labor rights or environmental standards to gain competitive advantages. Both have reference to ILO principles but the EU has a more precise uh, uh, description about ILO conventions and the decent work concepts. And both also include the dialogue-based cooperation models involving governments, civil society and stakeholders. And when it comes to the enforcement, which maybe is the most important part of this discussion, the American model might look more efficient in theory with the options for sanctions in, uh, in the form of fines or tariffs, but in practice it seems to be merely hypothetical. We have had one case, the Guatemala case, which was lost by the US uh, this, uh, this summer. And the EU is not only about soft dialogue. The EU approach includes both the carrots and the sticks in the form of market access, political pressure, etc. So I think we have to come to a conclusion that we should maybe not spend all our energy to discuss sanctions or not, but instead focus on how future trade agreements can be used effectively to promote workers' rights. I think it is important to emphasize that this is not about protection or protectionism. It is about making trade working for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Now is coming Axel Berger. We have suggested that Axel will be addressing 
the environmental provisions in RTAs, different approaches and lessons from innovations. Uh, Dr. Berger is a researcher at the German Development Institute, Department of World Economy and Development Finance in Bonn. He holds a doctorate in political science from the University of Duisburg, Essen, and a master degree from the Munich Ludwig Maximilians University in political science, economics, and modern history. Some areas of current research of uh, Axel include the impact of free trade agreements on upgrading within global value chains and the role of the G20 in global governance. He has advised developing countries, developed agents, agencies, and international organizations on trade and investment agreements. Peter, Thank Axel. You Do you have the... Uh, yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. To, to speak here on this panel about uh, environmental provisions in uh, free trade agreements or uh, regional trade agreements. Uh, my presentation, which will be a very brief one, I will also only uh, touch upon the main, uh, main issues, uh, it's, it's based on a joint research project we have uh, with the University of Laval. Um, uh, they developed um, a very interesting database about environmental provisions in uh, in free trade agreements, and we partnered up with the uh, University of Laval, in particular with uh, uh, Professor Jean Frederic Morin, and came up with a hopefully nice and hopefully uh, practical uh, uh, visualization tool in order to provide the general public and experts uh, with a tool to dive into the um, 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 different environmental provisions in free trade agreements. So I will make uh, uh, four, uh, four points uh, today. Um, first of all, environmental provisions um, in these new uh, modern type deep free trade agreements are becoming this, uh, a standard feature, right? So if you look at this graph, 85% um, of all um, RTAs have one or the other um, uh, one or more uh, environmental provision. Um, if we look at the uh, most recent agreements, we will find that on average, 80, uh, we find uh, 60 uh, different environmental provisions in the mo in most recent RTS. So that's quite substantial, right? Environmental provision um, today are a standard feature of free trade agreements. So that's what my first point. My second point, um, these provisions are getting increasingly diverse. So uh, we started in the late 1940s with the um, inclusion of um, exceptions um, for environmental purposes. And today we have uh, more than uh, almost 300 different types of environmental provisions that we find in trade agreements. So that's, uh, that's my second point. That's I mean, we, we've, we have very different, uh, different provisions. For example, we have uh, references to environmental protection in the preamble. We have exception clauses uh, for uh, environmental uh, regulation in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the trade parts, but also uh, in, the, in, in the investment chapters of free trade agreements. We have, as, as Peter already mentioned, uh, we have provisions on cooperation, among the parties, we have uh, provisions that try to um, uh, try to incorporate the um, uh, civil society, so on, uh, on participation. But we also have very specific um, and very um, yeah very specific um, rules on different areas. So, for example, on, on fisheries, on illegal logging, on, um, on on waste, and so on and so on. There are cases that uh, we have more stringent rules on environment in free trade agreement than we have in, uh, in environmental uh, agreements. So that's, uh, that's my second point. We have environmental provisions are getting more diverse. Sorry. My third point um, relates to, to innovation. Um, the most innovative agreements have been signed a, a couple of years ago. So 
one of the most or mo maybe the, the most um, innovative, innovative uh, agreements. So this ag the, the agreement that came up with the uh, most innovative uh, provisions was NAFTA, right? Uh, signed uh, back in the 1990s. Second most innovative um, agreement was the agreement with uh, between the U.S. and Peru. So the U.S. actually drove uh, or was the main driver of this uh, of this trend to incorporate environmental provisions in free trade agreements. Um, the most recent agreements, uh, TPP 11 or how do you call it? CPTPP. CPTPP. Oh, so, <laughs> um, or CETA, the the agreement between the Canada and the EU, they incorporate a lot of these environmental provisions that m but most of these provisions have already been out there um, that's my third point so um, uh, the most innov innovative agreements uh, they were signed a couple of years ago already and a number of provisions are, are already out there um, and my fourth point relates to the diffusion of these uh, provisions um, as you can see in this graph some provisions diffuse more often than others so what is uh, provisions that are diffusing quite often are relating to um, exception, uh, environmental exceptions. They relate to cooperation. They relate to uh, environmental references in the preamble. So very, um, well, um, not so specific uh, type of provisions. But um, provisions on fisheries or domestic waste also uh, diffuse quite often in the, uh, in the network of uh, international, investment agreement, uh, international uh, trade agreements. So, on some, uh, in, in, in some areas, we can see a, a convergence um, of approaches uh, if you look at the free trade agreements. And so, one of the questions um, we can discuss later on is whether the uh, whether environment provisions are already ripe for multilateralization, uh, and if yes, which kind of provisions. But I think that's a qu uh, that's something we can discuss later on. Thank you so much, Axel. Now uh, we will have the opportunity of listening to Gail Strickler, President of Global Trade, Brookfield Associates, LLC. Gail has an impressive career both at the public sector and at the private sector. She served as the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Textiles and Apparel from 2009 to the completion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership in October 2015. She was the lead negotiator for the United States for apparel and textiles in the TPP and Trans Atlantic Trade and Investment, Investment, Investment Partnership, TTIP. Priori, Strickler served as a director of the Institute for Textile and Apparel Product Safety and Sustainability at Philadelphia University where she develops sustainability and envir environmental strategy programs for brands and retailers. She also served on the board of directors of the National Council of Textile Organizations from 2004-2006 as a member of his trade policy committee. She was a board member of the USDA Cotton Board from 2002-2008. She, she also served on the board of directors at New York's Fashion Institute, Institute of Technologies, FIT, Education Foundation from 2002 and the Executive Committee from 2005 until joining USTR. Jay, you, you will have another Thank you. Minutes. Thanks very much. Um, so I've put together a short presentation. I will try to speed through it, so I apologize. I'm also a New Yorker, as you can tell, and I speak very quickly, so I will manage to stay in the amount of time, even though I have enough slides to probably take up a good half hour. Um, I'm going to talk about textiles and apparel sector in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think it's really probably the premier industry to have this discussion because really, and um, I'll again apologize in advance, I'm probably gonna get ahead of myself, we're gonna get to slides and I've already said what's in them, so I'll really go fast. So, so really, textiles and apparel industry can be, it is like the Dickensian kind of theory, it's the best of times and the worst of times. The textile industry can provide jobs 
for the most vulnerable workers. It can provide jobs for women. Um, in many countries and cultures, it's really the only job, or at least the only job, in manufacturing. The reason manufacturing, of course, is significant is that it's the one area that you can start at a very low skill or completely unskilled level and actually acquire skills and be remunerated accordingly. And so for many women, you talk about, when I, I was in um, Cairo two weeks ago, and actually into many of the factories, it is the only thing that there, that the men in their families will allow women to go to work for is the textile and apparel industry. So it's, it can be a force for good. And we all know, you know, women's empowerment and what it means. For example, um, interesting statistic, a woman with even the lowest entry level job in a textile and apparel factory, her children in the developing world are 80% less likely to be malnourished than someone who doesn't have that opportunity. So women put food on the table. The second thing that women pay for is education in countries in which uh, there are school fees. So putting women to work has dramatic effects, not just on nutrition and health, but also on education and moving forward. So it really can be a force for good. However, it can also be a, force, a source of bad. I mean, when we talk about the sustainable development goals, we talk about water treatment and um, pollution and carbon footprint and all of this, this is one of the worst. And we are talking about in the era of fast fashion where everybody's buying new things all the time and then it's winding up in landfill, but I'm getting ahead of my own slides, so I will move on. Um, so the good. So economic empowerment of women, economic upgrading. In other words, you have to put in a grid, you have to put in roads to get things to the port, you have to upgrade the ports, so it definitely does add to industrialization of some of the countries that welcome this industry. Um, community and social development, particularly today, a lot of the factories are putting in, you know, and, and to some degree, for self-serving purposes. They want their people to come to work all the time, they've gotta make sure they're healthy. So a lot of when they started up putting in health centers and nurses in these factories, it was really for their own purposes, but it has become part of, and as we talk about sustainable development goals and what's going on, you're seeing these as, as de facto requirements, particularly by the brands and retailers. So, and again, to meet some of the needs, we're seeing um, the innovation of new methods of recycling, um, I'm working on a project right now in Africa in which I'm sure any of you who travel there are just appalled as I am by the plastic water bottles all over because they can't drink, the water's not potable from the faucets, so they're left even in the poorest communities to have to use bottled water. So <coughs> this, this, instead of seeing it as a source of pollution, it becomes a feedstock in this industry because it can become, it is basically PET, so it is polyester. So you see the innovation and repurposing of waste materials and the reuse of different things. A uh, European company has recently invented a fiber that uses used garments, breaks them down, mixes them with new fiber, and is able to create first quality fabrics out of that. So we see some innovation coming. Um, and again, the, in, for example, the factory I was talking about in, uh, where I was in Ethiopia, and I think I have a slide of it, they are putting in, because they have to, to meet the obligations to the government, they have to recycle 100% of their water. In doing so, they found out that the communities surrounding this industrial park don't have access to potable water, so one of the deals they made is they have a larger recycling center, and they are now providing potable water and well access to five um, communities that surround their factory. Um, so this, in fact, is the park in Ethiopia. They run 90% on renewable energy. They have zero liquid discharge. They recycle 100% of their post-industrial waste. They actually have on-site education to make it easier for people to show up for work every day and they're providing water and well access. So they are really helping build the community. So it can be a good opportunity. On the other hand, 20% of garbage in landfill in most of the developing world is leftover apparel, and more than 20% of the garbage in countries that produce it are the result of waste <laughs> from, those, from those factories. Um, 1.5 billion cubic meters of water are used for textile processing. It's just unsustainable. Um, water pollution as a result of in, inappropriate dyeing and finishing technologies. Labor and human rights abuses, as we all know, are systemic in this industry. So this, for example, is the Aral Sea, which is used to, um, was used <coughs> to, to irrigate cotton and basically 
completely utilized all the water and has destroyed the ecosystem in the region. Um, so this didn't come out so oh, this is so this is my kind of chart. So we've got like three areas in which is the textile and apparel industry is really bad in terms of its effect on sustainable development goals and where we really have to work on creating requirements that mean that it won't have negative effects, but it's really got a lot of areas in terms of education and communities and families and women's and empowerment where it can have significant positive effects. So um, again, poverty, putting food on the table, education, uh, gender equality, um, communities, but not great with clean water. Not, certainly not sustainable, but either is the fact that we as consumers, um, particularly the US and the EU, are, util are buying 50% of the apparel produced in the world that is just, it's completely not sustainable. And we really need to think about how we're going to affect that going forward. Um, in terms of trade policy and sustainable development goals, this, I won't go into the details here. I'll make sure this is available to everybody if they want to look it up. This is kind of a review of some of the labor issues, which I think some of my um, co-panelists have already mentioned um, when they were incorporated into US and EU agreements. Uh, the scope of these, the extent to which, and the enforceability of the labor and environmental provisions um, has varied and seems to be growing. Uh, one example, for example, one of the issues I think in terms of labor that we need to think about is there have to be benefits from um, acting, you know, being a good actor in this realm, and mm -hmm. there has to there has to be like a carrot and a stick, basically. So, for example, in Cambodia back in 2005, before quota went away, the United States had put in a policy where they rewarded with the Better Works program run by the ILO, they rewarded Cambodia with additional quota if they, in fact, met certain labor goals. And it was quite successful. The problem is now you don't have, we don't have quota, we can't do that. But what we do have is um, up to 32% duty on clothing and apparel. So we really can use lowering duty levels, or we could use lowering duty levels to make this compliance um, positive. It, it would be, this is how it really could be working. Um, in terms of environmental provisions, similar, but again, a little bit harder to enforce. How do you make sure that a product, by the time you're talking about the apparel being imported, how do you know that the yarns, the fabrics, the dye stuffs used up to that point met the sustainability goal? So you're going to have to have some kind of certification. But encouraging the use of recycled material through d duty benefits or encouraging the methodologies that are more environmentally friendly by offering duty benefits it has a substantial um, pull because you have, again, up to 32% <laughs> duty in the US to 20% in the EU. Um, and in terms of emerging economies that are starting to uh, absorb more and more of the apparel produced in the world, they can hopefully take um, a lesson from some of these things and basically not even allow in. I mean, the Chinese have put in some pretty restrictive rules. Now, we can say that those are really being used um, as a completely protectionist measure, but if you look at them, they could potentially have a really positive environmental impact at such point that they become more of a consumer society going forward. So there, there, is, some, there is light at the end of some of the tunnel. Um, so how could we very quickly, with not enough going on, unfortunately, across the street um, and elsewhere, um, how could we use what we have to try to make the trade policies we already have, the preference programs and the FTAs we already have, more sustainable and more um, productive in terms of requiring them to meet goals of the SDGs? And once again, I said this earlier, but again, I will stress that if we started to allow accumulation across RTAs and preference programs, we could very quickly um, dramatically increase the adoption of high standard sustainability. And the reason being that you want to produce when, um, an apparel manufacturer or a textile manufacturer, or really this is true in almost every area, whether it's jewelry or leather or footwear, et cetera, 
you want to be able, a large company or even a small company now in a global matrix and in a digital economy wants to be able to export to as many places as possible once they make a product. So by requiring compliance at the highest level of all of the RTAs, you would then allow them to be able to export that when they get an order really for anywhere in the world. This could have significant meaning. Um, if you create that the bar that this product at this level can be exported anywhere, that's the one they're going to meet. It's unlikely that they're going to produce things that don't meet that requirement and then are restricted in their ability to export it. So it is a way to really raise the bar pretty quickly, I think. Um, beyond policy of innovation, we talked about um, more recycling, more renewable products. Um, closed loop production that's going on, and supply chain transparencies, ways to really verify that these things were, that these products were produced accordingly. And there's some new products out there that are doing that. Um, you can take a look at, at this. I'll make sure this is available to everybody. And again, the other thing that really matters, and I think we all know it's even more significant than any kind of government relations or any kind of government regulations or any other kind of way of enforcing, which is really public engagement and private sector response. Today, one bad tweet can cause a co company to lose literally millions of dollars. So social media has become um, probably the best opportunity we have to expand the use of these kinds of requirements in our FTAs, in our preference programs, and just in importing into your country in general. Um, these are just some examples of, for example, sustainable clothing, traceable down, um, all of these things that are now becoming required. Anyway, I won't take up any more of your time mm. on this, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gay, for so comprehensive presentation. Okay. Now is uh, time for listening to the European perspective. Madeleine Tuninga, Tuninga, since 2016, she's head of unit of the unit in digital trade responsible for trade and sustainable development. The unit covers a broad area of topics, <coughs> including trade aspects of labor, environment, climate, gender, development, and human rights. Activities include, amongst others, policy developments, negotiation and implementation of the EU trade and sustainable development chapters in free trade agreements, the management of the EU's generalized system of preference, uh, the trade side of corporate social responsibility, responsible business conduct, and the trade side of the uh, <coughs> SDGs. From 2012 until 2015, she was head of unit of trade defense investigations, leading a team of 25 colleagues since 2012. Between 2003 and 2006, Madeleine was coordinator and market access negotiator for various WTO accession negotiations, on a particu and in particular, Russia's WTO accession to WTO. From 1998 until 2003, she was coordinator and market access negotiator of the free trade agreement negotiations with Mexico, Chile, and Mercosur. Prior to this, she worked at the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands, where she was police officer for the US and Canada yeah. and for some WTO yeah. dossiers. Madeleine, you will have okay, thank you. seven minutes. Thank you, thank you. I have seven. You've expanded. Ten. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. After this. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for being here still at 5.30. I fear there would be an appetite to do other things, but um, um, I'm very happy that you join on what I find one of the most challenging topics, actually, of trade policy of today, um, coming down to how do we translate SDGs in one of the policy fields being, being trade policy and make that compatible and coherent and complementary with all these other policy areas. Um, so I, you've asked me to talk about the EU um, experience in integrating sustainable, sustainability provisions, evolution over time, and perspectives for the future, and that in five or maybe ten <laughs> minutes. 
Um, I, I will, in this round of talks, try to focus a bit on the challenges and opportunities. Um, maybe first to say that the EU experience, um, EU has actually a long experience in links between trade and sustainability in various trade tools. Um, we probably have a longer experience in our general uh, unilateral uh, preference systems, um, but also in, uh, in free trade agreements, although it was a little bit more scattered as will have appeared in your studies. Um, the real trade and sustainable development chapters um, are only there since the Korea FTA, which entered into force in 2011, so we speak eight years. Um, since then, six agreements have entered into force, of which two covering a region, Central America six, and the Indian countries there are three, and the remaining are Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and recently CETA. Japan we hope to welcome next year, and in the pipeline we have Vietnam, Singapore, um, and others are on the negotiations. In fact, right now there's a Mercosur team negotiating, trying to do the finishing touches, hopefully um, preparing for the finishing touches of Mercosur, and Mexico is also towards the end. Um, and we're starting with Chile. <laughs> Where, where we have, in, incidentally, we have very high hopes because Chile is a champion in gender chapters. Um, you started it and we are looking forward to have our first gender chapter with Chile. Um, so maybe a word on the designs of EU TSD chapters. You've had some indications to it. Um, and other than uh, one of the previous speakers suggested, um, the EU chapters have binding provisions um, with monitoring and enforcement mechanisms. Um, including dispute settlements, and we do not share the view that if you don't have trade sanctions, you don't have enforcement mechanism. Um, but that, that's a different perception and a different definition. Um, it's true that in the li literature, what we have is a deep cooperation model, um, uh, which distinguishes it from a model that, that adds sanctions to, to it. And I'll get back to that. So the other thing that, that we have is we've put labor and environment together and we are quite keen in not making a too big distinction between these two. Um, it's probably a political reason. We, both constituencies in the EU uh, are very important um, and we don't want to su suggest that one is more important than the other and in fact both are critical. Um, on content, we have two angles, um, so we are not designing new standards, we rely on the ILO and multilateral environmental agreements, um, those relevant for trade amount to around 12 multilateral environmental agreements. Um, that has a, and the second uh, substantive provision, and it was also already mem mentioned, is uh, you can give it different definitions, it's keeping up high levels, so in other words, you cannot lower your standards, um, in order to attract trade of investment. That has two angles. It has a level playing field angle, but for the EU it also has an important angle that trade agreements do not lower what we think are the high standards we have in the EU. Um, a word on this, uh, why we have these ILO uh, references. Some suggest that it is a reaffirmation, you don't do anything new, but there is a philosophy behind it. We are true multilateralists. Um, we want, by all means, not to set new bilateral standards, but we want to reinforce the multilateral system, and not only the, the standard and the rule, but by reaffirming that in the agreement, also the monitoring me mechanism that each of them has. Uh, and in fact, one of the journeys we have, and I think if we talk about the future challenges, is precisely how to marry these things together. Now, in terms uh, also the design of EU chapters, in, in terms of institutional setup, uh, we have a ins unique institutional setup. We have a government level committee, which is usual, which all committees have, but we also have a, a civil society setup. So there are dedicated domestic advisory groups for each FTA uh, that advise their governments, but also come together with civil societies of the other side to advise, give recommendations and opinions on the implementation of the TSD chapters. Now, a word on evolution over time, uh, both on the content side and on the process side. Uh, so, indeed, also in our case, I mean, we learn by doing. Uh, new areas are added um, or existent are deepened. To just give you an example, the corporate social responsibility or RBC dimension 
um, is, uh, is really becoming a prominent part in our agreements. It's the missing ground on business evol involvement. And what we see is that the supply chain, you, you said it a little bit in an other, other way, but the supply chain is an extremely useful pressure um, uh, to, um, uh, to improve labor conditions on the ground and environmental conditions on the ground. Then in environment, we started already with it, but we've developed a little more. We also have some thematic articles. So there in some areas, there's no multilateral agreement, and we have, um, uh, for example, forestry, we have thematic articles. Um, and then another evolution over time is that uh, these civil society structures that we originally linked to the trade and sustainable development chapters, we had a lot of feedback that actually people wanted to talk about the entire agreement, which makes sense. So the, in Mexico and Mercosur, these structures will be extended to the entire agreement. Another example is Paris. Um, the the uh, terrain is important of climate has made that in the agreements with Japan and Mercosur and Mexico, um, we, we are giving a particular prominence to the Paris Agreement and give more hands and feet on the implementation through FTAs. Um, on the process side, we now have gained some experience, and as um, um, Peter has said, we've launched in the EU a debate on experience with the implementation to, to test the temperature and the experience. It's still in full swing. I was afraid in the beginning that it was too early, because it's true Korea's eight years, but most are two, three years, and for most trade agreements it takes at least two years to, to get the institutional structure running, to get all the involvement. But, but I still think it was an extremely useful exercise and still is. Uh, what I can say is that there is a consensus that we absolutely need to do better. This debate has helped us to move significantly up the political ladder this topic. So it, it is not anymore within, I'm in DG trade, I, I'm not filmed I hope, but it is in a way the classical trade cowboys. Um, it's not always easy to get these topic high on the agenda. Uh, with the inclusion of the chapters and now this debate, this and probably people have followed that we've had a TTIP uh, uh, evolution within the EU uh, and also CETA. So all these developments do have their reflection and I, I would say that certainly now these chapters are very important. What is also clear is that we are not using the full potential of the agreement. Um, functioning of the civil society structures, we need to do better. There's a lot of practical things uh, we are getting as feedback. Monitoring practices need to be better. We're doing a lot now, um, stepping up in terms of our work with the ILO and the MEAs, um, uh, involving member states. We have 28 member states. Not all of them are present in third countries, but it's a huge pool of uh, resources and pressures, moments that can, can help implementing, and certainly a more assertive use of existing dispute settlement procedures, which, by the way, we've never used so far. So those who say it's ineffective, um, <coughs> I, I don't know which ground it is. We've never used what, what we have. Um, maybe the most, um, I think what the most important is what we can see. It's not all bad, so to say, and lessons learned. For me, the, one of the most important feedback that, that we get as, as feedback is that we, we are able to put things on an agenda on very sensitive areas. Um, and what we learn is that um, I, I al I'm always hesitant with the carrot and stick approach. Um, this is a topic where you really need a sustained engagement over a long period of time to bring about changes. And trade alone will not do that. You need trust of your counterpart and ownership and empowerment of our partners. I'll give you two recent examples. Three maybe. Guatemala. We are, with all respect, but we are we are cleaning up the mess created by the dispute settlement case with the US. There's a total frustration, eight years of talk of dispute settlement governed by lawyers. No construction and building. So we are now sort of retaking and building the trust, giving them the responsibility to do it because they want it, um, and trying to interact with the ILO. I'm not saying that we are there, but the, the, the shooting approach has consequences. You, you, you have to invest in a country to want to, to bring changes. Vietnam, we are having the same. I mean, we are still in the pre-pre-ratification, but they are now looking to, for EU contact points and missions and visits to help them to, through the labor code um, approach. Why? Because they said we need to rebrand it. The, the cop that came in during the negotiations made that it was not us who wanted this. We had to do it because somebody else imposed it for it. 
Whatever we do with it, we have to listen to that. Countries do want that. We are not dealing with countries who do not want labor reforms. They do want. But in Vietnam, you're dealing with um, um, a communist country, so you need to bring into account um, a context. Um, and uh, so um, I think that this is one of the things we certainly we are bringing, uh, we are bringing with, with us. Maybe a word on uh, the future. Challenges. I think we have many challenges. For me, one of the key are to deepen the interaction with the ILO and MEAs. It must re remain compatible and reinforcing and not duplicating efforts. Example, Guatemala. We have serious issues, violates our agreement, violates the US agreement, but in the ILO, all the parties involved in the monitoring decided to not go to the highest sanctions in the ILO, which is the establishment of a commission of inquiry. All justified within their context, but for us, we need to pose the question, is the wisest next action then to do dispute settlement in a bilateral agreement? It's undermining the ILO. I would rather say force the ILO to first exhaust their, their avenues and then come to us. But mm. these are all questions. I don't have the, the golden formula, but we need to think about how we do that. And you can, I can run you through all the multilateral environmental agreements. They all have their own mechanisms, and we need to think about how can we do that more intelligently. Um, other challenges um, is, to, in our case of the EU, to, to a large extent linked to level playing field and domestic expectations. Um, one angle is to say that the ILO and multilateral environmental standards are there to create a level playing field. I think in the origin that this is, this is the thinking of um, uh, uh, using the ILO conventions uh, through our trade agreement. Um, and we are not set, setting the standard in. But an, another angle is that our agreement needs to safeguard high levels of um, protection. You cannot lower the standards in order to attract trade or investments. But obviously between an ILO standard and the high standard that people in our place of the world think that we have, everybody thinks of course their standards are the best, um, there is this frustration that there is this gap between these two. So shouldn't you use the trade agreements to impose your high norm on others? Th that's, I think, a driving force between a lot of things that we discuss. Um, and I think at the moment it's still management, wh uh, manageable. Where I see the biggest challenges coming up is in climate. For the time being, all enthusiasm is in the implementation of Paris, it's voluntary standards. If in five years' time we see the gap between the level of commitment increasing, the pressure on trade will increase. And that, that's what we need to anticipate. And the interesting thing of the FTAs we have, I think, mm. is that we, we, we are forced to think about it. So we are, we're developing a lot of ideas on how to implement Paris through the bilateral agreement. But for me, th th this tension and these expectations is, is, is a big uh, challenge to look at. And then maybe as a, um, uh, two final points, increasing impact of corporate social re responsibility in RBC. This is the whole value chain discussion. EU companies since this year for the first time have to do reporting on how they uh, comply with um, the SDGs, so a lot of um, environment and labor. Um, and you see that companies on the ground down the supply chain are feeling this because they're getting questions. So this is a very interesting dimension. And then my final point is we ha really have to remain realistic. We are undergoing this debate in the EU, and we sometimes see unrealistic expectations of what trade can do. Um, uh, and and you, you need to put a, a little bit of the reality into there. There are two sides of this. Um, you, you, Guatemala, a bit the US approach. If you, if you take sanctions, you necessarily get into a trade impact test, so that significantly narrows your, your, your scope. We have a bit of a bigger scope, but we can neither do everything. And what some in Europe now think we can do is we can do the entire ILO in our agreements, and whatever happens in the ILO as a violation is sanctioned through a trade agreement. So realism, I think, is also an important one. I see my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madeleine. And now is, is coming Pablo Arturo Lasso Grandi. Uh, he will be bringing us the, the voice of the Latin Americans. Pablo has an extensive uh, experience at the uh, ILO and also uh, um, as a senior advisor to, to the Ch Chilean Director General of International Economic Affairs. Um, also, he, he, um, he held several many important positions in the Chilean Labor Ministry for 11 years including Head of International Relations, Executive Secretary of the Canada-Chile Labor Agreement, 
pro tempore secretary for the Inter-American Labor Minister Conference and deputy director of labor. He also has an extensive record of publications and one of the main of that publications is the trade agreements and their relations to labor standards, the current state of the art. Uh, this publication uh, has been launched by the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development in Geneva in 2010. Pablo. Thank you very much uh, and thank you for this uh, invitation. I'm very honored to be this uh, very important panel and with uh, such an audience uh, in such an interesting matter. Um, let me begin by saying that um, I come from Chile, which is a very uh, little country compared to uh, the blocks of the European Union, United States, or Argentina, or Brazil here in Latin America. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we have been uh, uh, very uh, fond of uh, having um, trade agreements with our partners, uh, but including as well since the very beginning, <coughs> labor clauses in it. Uh, we thought that we couldn't just make economic policies without embracing at the same time social justice purposes and environmental issues. We are committed since the very beginning of our openness in the 90s when we recovered democracy uh, in 1990 uh, to have a strong democratic commitments social commitments as well as economic. And in the economics we have uh, been champions of the free trade agreements uh, campaign because of the uh, so slow developments in WTO. And uh, as well we have strong commitments in ILO as to have the Director General being our ambassador of Ansumavia there as Director General of ILO. So we have been strongly committed to social affairs, to, sh to labor issues, and because of that we have made strong labor reforms from our own will, for our own political decision to strengthen our labor inspection, to strengthen our labor justice system, and <coughs> at the same time being uh, developing uh, all our trade, uh, trade uh, partnership with many of the principal main economies in the world, like uh, United States, European Union, of course, but also with Japan and also with China. So we have uh, already our about 8 percent, more than 8 percent of our trade covered by preferential trade agreements. So we have succeeded in having those records but at the same time we have developed social justice purposes, decent work uh, system, and uh, we are committed to that. And because of that, we went all, all the way around asking for our trade partners to have trade uh, commitments with labor issues as well. So I had to go to China, for instance, and ask in Beijing to my colleagues in Beijing to have a trade agreement with uh, labor issues. Mm. And of course, the first reaction was not uh, very uh, acceptable, but finally we made an agreement to cooperate on decent work, and we all know what decent work means. And uh, uh, we, we actually went to Australia, and Australia was very reluctant. Why we have this discussion on labor issues in a trade agreement, this is an issue of uh, ILO. No, we shouldn't have this discussion in a free trade agreement. But we insist it. But uh, with the same argument, we, we need to send the signal, the political signal, that when we are going to make trade and benefit some people from the trade agenda, we must give them assurance to the labor rights that they are going to be respected. And finally, 
there was very difficult to have a little reference to this work with uh, Australian at the time, but on the TPP they were very accepted. And then the reflection was, it is the importance of your uh, strength uh, when you are negotiating, because it's not the same to be a little economy like Chile than a bloc like the European Union or uh, US or even Canada, which are stronger economies. New Zealand was very much alike, uh, like ours, for instance, because they had very problems, much problems. We, we were very alike in the sense of being demander of these liberal clauses, uh, but they had strong difficulties to convince uh, their trade partners to be in the same vein. But finally, uh, the results were very, very, very good for us in the sense that we think that uh, the uh, economic results of our openness with the trade agreements have been very fruitful. We have already uh, <coughs> augmented uh, clearly our uh, exports and uh, non-traditional exports as, uh, are very, more Im very much important. And uh, uh, we are covered from uh, disruptions in the political ground when someone claimed to be protectionist. Well, we have now some protection with the free trade agreements. And uh, uh, with labor clauses, we have been cooperating in many areas. And we have some uh, interesting results, for instance, with the TPP original, think. which was the P4. Um, Sorry. Sorry, I don't have a glass. The fourth uh, partner there was Brunei. Yes. Well, at the time Brunei was even, wasn't even a member of ILO. But after that, he became, it, it became a member. Because uh, they understood that this is an, an important issue to be part of the international community, to be part of the... And <laughs> Two, uh, two years ago, I, I saw them being member of the governing body of the ILO. So th it's interesting the evolution that you may have with this uh, kind of uh, agreement. And the important thing for us is that we must convince them. We must <laughs> try hard to convince our partners to be uh, acceptable for these social, social clauses because we have not the power, the bargaining power, like uh, US or European Union, which offer uh, the, the issue of ac market access, which is the important thing for the developing countries to have that access. Uh, in our case, the access of market we can offer is very limited, so uh, the effort of me, uh, convincing them was always very hard. And so, um, finally, we think, uh, in general, our experience show that we can have sound political uh, and economic uh, uh, issues uh, on openness, but at the same time, they can be uh, uh, along with uh, social and labor issues as well, with, uh, and environment, of, of course, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pablo. Now the floor is open. Um, anyone from the public wants to? We will have oh, only 10 minutes for. Oh, I can just speak up. No, no, it's the mic is. Um, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. My name is Thibaut Botson from the University of Berlin. Um, I have two questions. The first one is a, is a general one and a quite straightforward one. Um, do we have any um, assessment of the impact of labor provision in trade agreements? Do we know what, are, what is the impact, the concrete impact on workers in the different concerned countries? That's the first question. Uh, the second question, which is perhaps more um, intended to, to Madeleine, um, with um, relates to, to the United Kingdom and the future trade agreement uh, between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Um, it seems that to many respects, um, this trade agreement or this future relationship 
will be very uh, special. Why? Because of, of course, geograph geographical proximity with the country, because of uh, the economic industrial profile of the UK and the European Union, which is uh, very similar, and of course because of um, the extent of commercial uh, flows that will be between both countries. So I have a question with respect to the design of the future uh, uh, label provision in the trade agreement. Do we have to expect something like what we can see in the uh, CETA treaty? Or will we try to um, arrange a new kind of design? And a sub-question would be, what about um, the upholding level of protection clause? Uh, can we anyhow try to strengthen, or is there any need to, to strengthen uh, that clause? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Are you addressing your question to anyone in particular? Um, well, I have part of, uh, of course, I have, I have much more um, um, uh, skilled uh, colleagues ar around here, but in, as part of this exercise that we're going through now, we, we, we've done, we've looked at a lot of studies, um, and in fact, there are, there are some very interesting studies. I mean, there, there, there's a variety of those who compare more text, and there are those who try to develop more impact assessments. Of course, we have our own impact assessment. So every FDA ex ante and ex post has impact assessment. That's one tool. The ILO did a very interesting study on uh, labor provisions um, and actually produced a handbook on labor provisions. Uh, one of you participated, I think, in the event, so maybe you want to say something on it. And I was recently, so there's a colleague, Damian Raas, a Swiss, um, who with 12 colleagues, they've produced a very interesting study who they just presented and precisely are looking at the impact and they analyze both the different models, so deep cooperation model and sanction model, whether they have more impact and they tend to say that, conclude that deep cooperation models have uh, more impact or um, more impact than, uh, are more efficient. Um, but they've also been looking at what does it mean in terms of labor provision. It seems to be rather positive what came out. I can send you a link of that. But I, I thought that, at, that the, in the beginning of that thinking, I thought that that was very interesting. Um, because that's, that's key, and I'm zooming in now on TSD, but politically within the EU, the social dimension is enormous. I don't know if you followed the Juncker uh, uh, presentation, harnessing um, uh, globalization. The social dimension is absolutely critical in there. So there, there's no question that that needs to be better analyzed. The, the future U UK trade agreements, I can, of course, li say little about it. Um, uh, the first to, to know is what type of what type of UK we will have, and that is to a large extent in the end of the UK. Is it part of the internal market or not? Or is it half part of the internal market or not? Um, that will, to a large extent, determine because you're here, of course, in the regulatory area. So, if you're part of the internal market, you comply with EU standards, and that question becomes much less relevant than if you are totally out of the EU. Um, the model we have at this moment, uh, the latest we have, is CETA. So, that's certainly something where we will be looking at, um, and then we need to see how we determine our negotiating position. Um, but this is not only. The, I, I think this is the entire regulatory component that is, of course, of key concern when you look at Brexit. Not only labor, it's environment, it's, um, I guess, in competition, that it's in many areas. Um, and, and if you've seen the sort of crisis there was at some point, it was on the little sentence that said regulatory <laughs> dimension. Yes, uh, for the first question, I think uh, we can, I can uh, respond on the Chilean perspective, uh, we have had a very strong uh, experience on labor cooperation with our main partners, uh, beginning with European Union. We have uh, about six uh, dialogues between uh, civil society in, uh, in Brussels and uh, European Union countries, and in Chile with the European Union members uh, being in Chile with the big discussion with our trade uh, unions and companies uh, uh, and topics on health and safety issues or collective bargaining, social dialogue, uh, gender issues. And so very constructive and uh, uh, there was very open our society to, le to learn about the experience of uh, 
of the European Union countries. Uh, on the other side, we have uh, very strong uh, cooperation with Canadians on many topics. We used to have two meetings in the, by year at the very beginning, being this the first agreement we had uh, at the time, so we were very uh, interested in developing a, a strong cooperative agenda. So we talk about gender issues, we talk about health and, uh, health and safety, we talk about collective bargaining, we talk about liberty, uh, freedom of association, all the topics, uh, labor inspection, labor tribunals, uh, whatever, who, who was important. And with the participation of unions in both sides. So uh, I learned about the problems of union scene, uh, in uh, Canada, in many cities of the, uh, of the Canadian country, as well as uh, we show our ex experience without hiding anything from the Chilean perspective. So uh, that created a transparency atmosphere, very uh, in interesting to solve some problems with channels not covered by the agreement, but informal channels. So in one time, for instance, there was a problem with the uh, company of Canada who have dismissed some people in Chile. So the Chilean guys didn't go to the Canadian uh, secretariat to then make a claim to us. And instead they came to me as the secretary of the agreement of Chile. And I wrote a letter to the minister of the labor in Canada and the minister of labor in Canada talked to the company in Canada to talk to the company in Chile. So that was a very good uh, <laughs> way to solve the problem, which is at least, at least the important issue to solve the problem of the people. So that was things that uh, functioned when you create an atmosphere of trust and goodwill among the people. With the US, we have extraordinary good uh, experience uh, with uh, uh, USTR and uh, US doll as well. And uh, I recognize this because when we signed this agreement, and I present this agreement in, in, uh, w in uh, the American State Conference, I told people there, I will tell what is the experience to have an agreement with you in this context, with trade sanctions. Because there was big reluctance of the uh, American countries, developing countries in America, to have this kind of uh, trade sanctions. And this was the first uh, agreement after the TPA with the Bush, Bush president. And uh, I must say that with Canada and with US being having the chance then to have trade sanctions, instead we have a strong cooperative agreement, a very positive and constructive experience. With the US, with you, with that. On the other side, in TPP, uh, P4, uh, in this sense, not TPP 11 or 12, <laughs> by now, uh, very good, uh, interesting experience, because at the, at the beginning, uh, they were very reluctant from Singapore and Brunei to have these kind of exchanges with trade unions uh, uh, and the political consequences, and, but after, three, four years, that they began a very interesting experience and exchanges and openness, so very positive. And uh, I stop there because I have no more time. Peter. Yeah, thank, thank you. I, I just also wanted to, to give my, uh, my comment. The, uh, the report I was referring to did not find, you can say, significant evidence that there was this kind of, you can say, clear uh, results from, from the labor provisions. Um, this could also be linked to the fact that it is a relatively short period, for instance, when you see from the from a EU perspective. But I, I also have to say that we come back to something about this soft, hard approach when it comes to, uh, to enforcement. Because, I mean, it is no secret, uh, Madeleine, that when it comes to the, to the EU-Korea agreement, there has been a disappointment about the lack of improvement of labor standards in that country. 
and that there have been recommendations from the domestic advisory group twice to the to the commissioner to launch, you can say, the uh, the official um, dialogue with, uh, with with Korea, and first after the European Parliament uh, this year uh, came to the same uh, conclusion and called for this, it was you can say received positively from from Commissioner Malmström. And, and I think this, maybe this points to, to one point which I really want to mention here. <clears throat> we find in our policy recommendations from my confederation that instead of having this, this discussion about uh, which regime works best when it comes to uh, the soft or the, or, the, or the hard approach, sanctions or no sanctions, maybe it's more important to, to face realities when you are negotiating. So when, I mean, it's often when the EU is negotiating, I mean, Pablo is a very good example to say that even as a country that is not one of the big uh, economies in the world, you can in fact also have this approach that you want to do something for the, for the environment, you want to do something to improve social standards. And I think it's extremely helpful also to, um, to, to try to avoid that when the EU will come with their uh, package of, of standards, that it will be seen as a way to, uh, to smuggle in uh, protectionism. Um, but, but my point is that if you are honest about the importance of this and don't see it as something that is subordinated to the economic uh, or trade volume uh, aspect, but say that this is really something that we want to see that uh, the trade agreements shall be a benefit to, to ordinary people and to the environment. Maybe then you should look more into what is happening during negotiations and to make the plan for the ratification and the implementation so you can say gradually, maybe you're also learning something from the, from the GSP uh, system, uh, Madeleine, and use this as a way also to create these incentives so that you know when you are at a certain level, you also gain these benefits. And I think that's much more interesting to look into than to the uh, sanctions or no sanctions discussion. I would just say that we have one situation, though, that we can compare, and that is the Accord versus the Alliance in Bangladesh. Um, as of right now, and that's, even though it's not an FTA, it's still a preferential agreement, um, and, or at least to some of the exports. And right now, uh, the accord, which is mostly the EU-based group, said, um, released, I believe, November 27th, a report saying that 90% of the factories were behind on their compliance and that they were going to have to extend the accord and not be ready to hand it over to Bangladesh. The alliance, which does have sanctions, um, and did not, you know, and said they could sanction and remove factories from the agreement, and is global. I mean, there are factories all over the world that are part of either one, but the alliance had a, a 35 percent of the factories were meeting their obligations. So, can I can really? I say something? I, I buy this, but what I don't buy is the comparison between an FTA and a unilateral preference system. You're in two totally different worlds. In one case, you're building an equal partnership with a third country, and you're not trying to start from the out and say, I'm the big guy and I'm going to impose it to you. You, 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 you talk <laughs> about leverage. It's a totally different situation. And for example, when you get come to dispute settlement in a trade agreement, you get to your trade impact. Why? Because you are in, an, in a bilateral agreement and there you happen to have to do these tests. In a unilateral scheme, you can do whatever you want. The US decided to withdraw from its preference system with Bangladesh. As, as a result, you don't have any leverage anymore. We've kept it. We, we're under strong pressure to, to withdraw it, but you don't need to pass all these tests. It's totally different when you're in a unilateral scheme you know, compared to... GSP, that's why I was talking about... Companies, yeah, yeah. but it's companies, what, what, how they do, they, they exert, exert their pressure, but I, I don't think that, that that's the sort of evidence that, that a sanction, and we are even very careful, because take the case of Bangladesh, even in your unilateral schemes, just to trick you through the steps that you have, you have Bangladesh, who largely depend on the EU for textiles, the other depends on China. Mm. That, that's not an easy partner, because if you go away, they go to China. Um, and 70 to 80 percent of the workers in textiles are women. So you withdraw, what happens? The economy collapses, 
and women are affected. So it is not, it's, it's highly frustrating because you, I, we could withdraw the scheme if we had to because it's a very painful long road. Um, but the situation is, of course, and that, that's only within that, not talking about the Rihonga uh, disaster. It is not that easy. The, 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 it, I think even in the unilateral scheme, it shows there is no quick fix to these very, very difficult things with often unstable countries. Anyway, but I, I know, know that it's different, but uh, we have in our internal debate often this sort of extension of GSP applied to, to FTAs, and then you, you talk to people who sit in a Brussels bubble and believe that the world exists, consists of Europe. Yeah, but there's another country, and you need to negotiate with that other country on a sort of equal footing. But I think that's why it's really interesting to hear Pablo's point of view about being a smaller country and how multilateral Another. agreements are give voice to really important and impactful um, requirements that smaller countries want. It's one of the reasons I love multilateral agreements, because everyone has a say at the table. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, going back to that question, I, I was uh, reserving for the final point, but since you touched that, I think That's the question now yeah. is the multilateralism. Uh, what are the answers from ILO or from WTO even? Are, are we going to discuss this? Mm -hmm. Because the trend since 1997 to up to now is that most countries are having a free trade, a free trade agreement with level clauses mm -hmm. and environment mm -hmm. clauses. So the time perhaps is now to begin to discuss this in the multilateral uh, arena. And that the question would be that the, the labor issues are the expertise of ILO and of the experts of ILO. So you're very wise in your comment on that. And uh, the ILO is now designing a new corpus of standards. We are revising wh what are the conventions uh, that are upgraded and downgraded. Mm. And that is being done now. Mm -hmm. I'm the, the advisor of the Grulag, for instance, on that uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. And we are discussing that by this moment, very moment. But this will take a long time, about 10 years. So, and what is the role of WTO? Mm -hmm. But let's stop there. Thank okay. you. There is a final question there. Thank you so much for all presentations. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Lima, I'm from Brazil, uh, Director General of AgroEconi. Uh, we're talking about uh, environmental and labor issues on FTAs and how this can help to provide uh, improvements and continuous improvement on environmental and labor uh, uh, agendas. Uh, but uh, uh, most of the times when we are talking about this two agendas, we are relying on ILO, uh, ILO and multilateral environmental agreements that is broader than ILO's conventions. They are much more tangible. But in some cases, countries rely on standards that are created by different groups, but different frameworks or different uh, coalitions and strategies that are not public, not necessarily public. How do you see in this, this case is when countries are relying on voluntary sustainability standards mm. or schemes mm. that are created by different stakeholders, considering that ultimately they, they can promote a lot of good issues and, and improvement, but at the end they can promote <coughs> some good So how, how, how do you see this relation uh, from countries relying what they want as the public sector on voluntary uh, standards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And taking ad advantage of uh, so smart uh, question, I would like to add some other very brief point that has to do with the automation and the digital economy. Um, we have been talking about the sticks, carrots, and how uh, are emerging the digital economy topics on the labor and environmental provision, but mainly on the labor provisions. For instance, how do you control the labor provisions in a global service economy without frontiers, with the digital platforms, 
in the middle of uberization of the economy. Mm. How do you exercise uh, or the enforcement of that labor provisions? Are you talking, are you thinking about that? Are the Isle, of course, is launching an initiative of automation in the new century, mm. but uh, that has to do with the question that the gentleman was raising too, because the new aspects of the, the economy, mainly the digital economy, are uh, calling us for new set of rules that are unknown, are uh, very difficult to, to be written and, and very important to be addressed to. So uh, if you agree, we are running out of time. The uh, inaugural session will be starting in a few minutes in the other floor. Uh, if you agree, you will have uh, one minute or two, uh, each one, to your final remarks and to respond to some of these uh, questions. Peter. Okay, well, maybe just on the WTO, since that was raised and I was going to say something more on it. Uh, in the WTO, you can't avoid the hard law, soft law distinction, because the WTO has binding dispute settlement. So if you want to bring multilateral environmental agreements, labor agreements, sustainability provisions more generally into the WTO, binding dis dispute settlement is the name of the game. So I'd be interested in the EU's uh, perspective on that. Um, and then on the private sustainability standards issue, I, I think that is a, it's a crucial one. So we did some work on this from the South African perspective. So we identified roughly about 7,000 standards that apply in the South African context, of which about 1,000 are mandatory and 6,000 are roughly categorized as private standards. So most of the standards that are applied are applied by multinational companies, both South African and foreign multinational companies. And there it's really up to the company to decide what kind of standards it's going to enforce. And if you want to be a supplier into that value chain, you either sign up or you don't supply. I think it's, it's quite, a, quite a simple choice. Is that good or bad? Um, I guess it, it depends who's asking the question. Well, I, I, I wanted to say, and I, I still think I will do, um, that when it comes to the relationship between the ILO and the WTO, you always hear the WTO excuse themselves by saying, well, this is not up to us, it's up to the member states whether we should uh, look further into these uh, aspects. And I mean, my starting point today was that with the adoption of the development goals, all UN member states have committed to decent work. So I think it should not be that difficult also to raise this issue within the WTO to, I mean, it's not the first time it has been raised, so why not go back uh, here in 2017, 18, and, uh, and relaunch that discussion about that. under which circumstances could the WTO also play a role in promoting decent work through the trade agreements in the future? I think that would be a major achievement. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we haven't talked that much about environmental provisions, mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but the discussion on, on, on labor issues was very fascinating. And uh, it shows that um, FTAs are a very interesting laboratory for new types of, of rules, be it on, on, on labor, be it on environmental provisions. But my feeling is that we need more transparency, uh, more information about which countries are, are adopting which, um, uh, which um, uh, provisions. So everybody deals with what the EU is doing, what the US is doing. But the, the discussion about the Chilean uh, approach, mm -hmm. it was very interesting. And so I assume that, a number of, uh, that there are a number of, of very, very interesting innovations, very interesting stories are out there which uh, would, uh, would, be of, uh, would be of value if, you, if we could um, uh, draw uh, more attention on this. And so I think uh, we, before we think about multilateralization, we, I think we need more transparency, more information about what countries are doing and maybe what, what, the, what the areas are where we see convergence and what they are the areas are, uh, where we see uh, divergence. Thank you. Okay. So, as you said, um, we've spent a lot of time talking about labor provisions and the ILO um, 
and how that works and what we haven't spent enough time and what really needs to be established, I think, at this point is somebody or some entity of how we're going to evaluate environment and incorporate climate change issues into all of this. Because right now, to me, um, we have made real progress, I think, on labor. Um, I think we all have an idea of where we see that going and it's working in a positive way. However, what I don't see, and, and again, coming from textiles where I said, you know, it's the best and the worst. And I look at other things that I've observed in my travels, you know, leather processing and footwear and and um, cement production and all of that. And the greatest issue facing all of us right now is climate change. Um, and what is going to be the governing body? What is going to be the ILO of, what is the WTO going to recognize as the, um, the leader or the evaluator or the assessor or even setting the standards for what is acceptable? And the other thing I'd like to say is that I hope, as we do this, that we work in the way that the ILO Better Works programs did, which is that we aren't just um, judging whether something meets something, but we are working towards sustainable goals, that we are giving credit for improvement every step of the way, because that's really the only way that this is going to work. And we really need to be able to buy things and have things and create things that we know throughout the whole supply chain met these sustainability goals, particularly from the environmental side, because it's very dangerous and very scary to be able to think that we are missing huge parts and probably some of the most damaging parts of the supply chain of much of what we are looking at. Um, so, uh, Boof, there's so much to say about this, but I think we touched on very important things. I, I, um, we've talked a lot, a lot about ILO because it's probably speaking more, f I take it as an example. We, we're sitting down now twice per year with the ILO and going one by one through all the MEAs because they're all unique and different. And Paris, exactly to whom do you speak? Because parties, members, decided to not have a very strong mechanism. That, that's their system. And for me, the challenge is, I will not change it through trade agreement, definitely not. So how can we be complementary and strengthen that? And that's what we, we're now trying to do with Canada. We want to think on how can we use CITA to, to give that hands and feet. And it will be journey because that element is missing, but it's a very important one. WTO, I think we should continue to push for it. Um, but I'm afraid that if your approach is this must be dispute settlement, a, you're going to get out at least 30 to 40 WTO members who will never agree on all these trade ends there. Mm. But I'm also afraid that you do not do justice to workers because you narrow it down to a business case. Can, you, can companies show that the lack of freedom of association leads to an economic damage? And that's not doing justice to it. This is why we are so keen on doing this journey together. I don't have the answers, but from a labor perspective, the issues are much broader. Um, and and that, that, for me, that's the challenge. And maybe the first step in the WTO is to do what today they're doing now on gender, is just to not, not hit that, that avenue, but see how can you use the platform that the, the, that the WTO experience sharing, precisely what Chile says, you're doing fantastic things in your bilateral dialogues that have an impact on the ILO and on trade. Promote that discussion and show the links rather than... Um, put it in the labor, because then you get on climate, you get a border tax adjustment uh, discussion, and I can tell you now where it leads to. <laughs> Paul. Well, um, about uh, the future of work, uh, we, are, well, we, and, uh, we are going to have the whole discussion of the International Labor ah, Conference yeah. on that issue. Yes. So it's going but, to have uh, a huge impact. On but the, the one thing I would, uh, I would say that technological change has been a permanent issue along civilization. The question now is the speed of that process now. And, the uh, and that threatens people. But that threats have been occurring always. And well, I can remember the Luditz, uh, the Captain Lud, the issues in, 19, in 1811 uh, in England, so uh, destroying the textiles. <laughs> So, uh, because of the a threat of, uh, yeah. of developing an industrial revolution. So, now we have the digital revolution, and, uh, but I, it, it seems not to be an issue 
so important and uh, it's uh, extra uh, dimension in my view. But uh, of course, this is going to be a big discussion. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have been discussing about the role of MNEs with the revision of the ILO uh, declaration on MNEs. We have the guiding prims principles discussion on human rights, and we have the OECD guidelines revised in 1911. So we have instruments to to deal with these issues, which are very important. And environment, huh? so mm -hmm. all these guidelines also deal with environment, labor, and absolutely, environment. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we have finished. We give the speakers a warm farewell. <laughs> and you are all invited to the inaugural session on the first floor. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.